I'm also going to, I'm starting the recording um, and I will send you the recording later on. Um, and we'll take a minute or two, um, maybe a minute to let people come in. Um, Good morning to those that join us from California. Good afternoon for those who are joining us from Israel. And good day wherever you are around the world. We are very excited to have you here. Uh, we just opened the line, so we'll give it a few more seconds for people to join our session. Um, just a reminder, this, uh, this event is being recorded. It's going to be available later on on our social media, on our YouTube. And um, we are looking forward to this discussion on security compliance for fintech companies. Very excited to have our speakers join us today. Um, and we will give it few more seconds to make sure that we have more attendees joining our session. In the meantime, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Sharon Vanek. I'm the Executive Director of the California Israel Chamber of Commerce, located in San Francisco, California. We also have an office in Israel. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, the CICC is a non-for-profit organization with a mission to support Israeli uh, companies to meet their counterparts in California and the other way around. We also support California-based um, entities exploring the Israeli market. Um, with us today, we have four speakers. I'm very happy to have you with us. Um, this uh, session is a webinar. Please uh, use the Q&A uh, chat box if you have any questions. We will monitor your questions uh, over there. Uh, feel free to just jump in and ask your questions and we will direct those to our speakers. Um, one more thing about uh, today, this is an hour long session. Um, we hope that you will stay with us for the entire uh, session. But again, if not, we will uh, be happy to send contact information later on and you can always uh, get back to us and ask your questions. Um, and we will do whatever we can to try and help you uh, with those questions. Um, all right, so I think we will start with introducing our moderator for today. Um, we have Nir Netzer with us. Hi, Nir, how are you? Hi, Sharon, how are you? Very I'm very good. well, thank you. thank you. Nir Netzer is the chairman of the Israeli Fintech Association, known as Fintech Aviv. He's also a founding partner with uh, Equitech Group has many, many years of experience, and I'm very excited and happy to have you here, share with, your, with us your experience and your uh, insights about the Israeli startup ecosystem in FinTech, and of course, uh, also from the rest of the speakers, which I'll let you introduce. Okay, thank you very much, Sharon, for having me and for hosting all of us. And thank you, CICC, and uh, to our audience. So today we're gonna have a super interesting discussion with. Very interesting speakers, as you uh, see right away. And we're going to talk about ways that fintech companies can gain clients' trust uh, with a cyber, cyber compliance certificate. We're going to talk about many ways on to, to protect, basically, your operations. If you're a fintech company or financial institution, it's going to be super in interesting. So uh, stay with us. Uh, we have Upendra Mardikar, the CISO of Snap Finance, with us. Hi, Upendra. How are you? Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. We have Tom Rosen, the CRO of GRC Consulting. Hi, Tom, how are you? Thanks for joining us. I'm great, thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. And Guy Levit, the CEO of Telemessage. Hi, Guy, thanks for joining Hello. us. Thank you for having me. Good, so uh, gentlemen, ready to start, shall we? Let's great. Start. I think it will be best if we'll go around the table, first of all, just to introduce ourselves, our companies in a real brief sentence, and then we'll take it from there. So um, who goes first? Guy, let's start with you. Hello, I'm Guy. I'm the CEO of Telemessage. Um, Telemessage is a 
uh, small, but uh, uh, we've been in this uh, business for quite some time. Uh, where I'm one of the founders of Telemessage. Uh, we've been in the messaging business for the last 20 years. Um, and uh, we deal with lo lots of different messaging solutions. Uh, but the one that we're focused on the last few years and the one that would be interesting for our audience here is what we call the mobile archiver, which captures and records mobile communication for compliance purposes, mainly for financial companies. So we can capture and record mobile SMS, MMS, and voice calls, but also the new communication channels like WhatsApp, WeChat, and we're adding now Signal and uh, Telegram and other instant messaging channels uh, over voice and text and multimedia and capture it for compliance. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, great. Thanks for that, guys. So basically, you are offering uh, an internal and external communication system that comply with the regulations for financial institutions, right? Yeah, the main use case is for various financial institutions that need to communicate with their customers. Mm -hmm. So internal is one piece of it. The, the main objective, the main use case is for traders, brokers, uh, retirement investment advisors, anybody under the FINRA regulations in the United States, but also other European countries which are under MIFID II regulations. Um, they're all under these types of regulations which require to uh, archive and retain any communication made from that financial institution to the customer. And that needs to be archived in some cases for seven years, some cases more than that. Um, and uh, it's a very growing uh, uh, you know, uh, a market with all the new communication tools coming out with all of the work from home that's happening. And we're taking our mobile devices and what was unthinkable uh, a few years ago, a trader uh, in a trading floor in a bank working from his home with his mobile device, it's, it's, it's what's happening today. So uh, that needs to be recorded and retained. Thank you for that. And we'll elaborate, of course, further along the way. Um, so uh, Tom, let's continue with you. Sure. So uh, you mentioned um, Tom from GLC. Um, we're a consulting company in the world of cybersecurity and privacy. And we work mainly with startups, helping them uh, meet the compliance requirements. It's uh, ISO 27001, SOC 2, penetration testing, PCI. Um, we do the readiness, we do the audits. So it's a really broad uh, services that uh, we offer, but the main idea is to create a cybersecurity program and help the startups uh, meet the requirements so they can go and stream more uh, deals in. Great, thanks for that, Tom. And when you say startups, I can only imagine that there are also growth stage companies in your client. Yeah, company. definitely. We work with uh, really uh, in the uh, still in the garage uh, startups up to startups in hyper growth. I can name a few as uh, Gong, Tabula that we work with, and even in enterprises that we we provide services with, uh, FICO, Amdocs, Teva. Um, so again, it's a really broad uh, range of services and we know how to adjust ourselves to the client needs. Okay, great. We'll hear all about it in a few seconds. Great. So Upendra, your turn. Please go ahead. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, uh, CICC, and uh, thank you for listening. Upendra Maldikar. I'm the Chief Security Officer for Snap Finance. I've been with the company for a little over a year. Um, Snap Finance is a late stage uh, startup. We are about 1500 people. Um, what we focus on, <clears throat> so there is this um, BNPL space that you guys might have heard, which is buy now, pay later. Uh, we also have lease to own as well as POS lending products and that we primarily focus on uh, subprime markets. Uh, and uh, our we are in UK, so we are international that way, but we'll be expanding internationally. So that's about me. And I have been with American Express prior to that for about five and a half years where I was uh, running multiple organizations over there. Prior to that with Visa and PayPal, I had a good run. So been in the uh, FinTech space uh, for qu quite a few years here. Thanks for having me. Of course, thanks for that, Yupendra, and we'll hear all about it uh, uh, as, as we go. And uh, maybe we'll start with a general question just to initiate our discussion, because gentlemen, as you know, the fintech field is known for obtaining and using sensitive client data. And we heard before about the heavy fines of financial institutions for violating different sets of regulations. 
uh, and, and actually about the constant security threat on these financial institutions um, and, and corporations in general. And when that being said, uh, what do you think is the best way for fintech companies and financial institutions uh, to protect themselves uh, on cybersecurity aspect? Let's talk about it. So uh, who wants to start? So I'll start. Uh, I'll, uh, start the, I'll start the thing. I mean, we um, see ourselves as an R&D company, right? We, we That's what we do. We create products, but we're very much focused on R&D. Uh, a little bit different, I think, than, than maybe some of the other companies uh, which do different stuff. But we, we really develop products. Now, not everybody develops products, but our product is, is based on R&D. So, uh, it needs to start from, from the beginning. When a developer starts writing code, then he needs to understand uh, from day one that there are various standards that he needs to meet to uh, when writing that code. It can't be uh, um, just you know getting a great developer starting to work, but it needs to be with the standards. So there's our standards like uh, OASP um, and there's frameworks that we build into uh, our development processes that make sure that from the beginning, when we start developing a product, that all security standards are met in place. So once you have the framework and the building blocks set up right, then you need to build on top of them. Um, and that, that's what we see ourselves. So there are various security standards that we meet uh, and are very important for any company that builds inside uh, uh, any kind of code that needs to meet that. And um, you know, there's packages that you need to use um, and uh, it, it needs to be deployed from the beginning to the end. Um, and when, you know, I, I assure a company like GRC and Tom, you'll talk about that, but when you, we implement the ISO standards, it's a very high level standard, but at the end of the day, it really needs to build into the building blocks of your code and onto your deployment. And uh, I guess there are some other things that we can talk about, but let's have a conversation around that, I guess. So complying with yes. security standards, yeah, definitely. Uh, Tom, go ahead, please. Yeah, so uh, echoing on what, uh, what Guy said, so definitely planning ahead and having the security implemented into your development process is important, but I think in a, in a more high level and taking it a bit even further, uh, further high level and um, I think it's really important to understand that while you build a security program, and it doesn't matter at what stage you are, you always need to look at a few elements and make sure that the cyber, your cyber program meets your uh, business needs. So in early stage, you probably won't be able, to, due to resources or maturity, to um, do ISO 27001 or do the SOC 2. But still, you will have to present some sort of assurance to the CISO on the other side that you are keeping and handling the assets in a very secure manner. So I think planning and adjusting your cybersecurity program should start from early phase and definitely should deal with the product. It should deal with back office and uh, operational security. And um, it's a really case by case because you need to take into account the market you're working in, the companies you're selling to, the assets you will be handling. That also is a big factor and it will definitely have uh, input on, on your program. If you deal with credit card information, you will have to do PCI at some point. The earlier the better, so you won't be exposed to anything. If you deal with um, PII, which is uh, personal identifying information, you probably will need to uh, meet with different um, privacy regulation. And again, every location, GDPR, as you know, is in Europe, New York Shield is in New York, CCPA is in California. So there is a holistic way you have to look at it. And, um, and then again, budgetary issues are what will limit the um, prioritization of your tasks. Definitely, um, and most definitely. And you, Pendra, if you have something to add on top of that, Absolutely. how do you see I mean, the security measurements that fintech and financial institutions needs to and uh, it's to adopt? Yeah, yeah, uh, and and you know, I completely agree with Guy, and uh, you know, so, so here is the thing, right? We have to really think why this compliance and financial regulations and punitive action has been there, right? So when we go back and look at financial institutions, fintech companies, they 
take personal information for the right reasons and they have credit card bank account social security for right reasons as we are going into the digitized age and we are going through all this uh, digital transformation and instead of cash we are using digital money right that's where the entire fintech business is all about is how do we ease the businesses and the financial transactions of our consumers and our customers what has happened is that during this particular journey, as we are going through this particular transformation, when internet came in, when mobile payments came in, when 2008 financial crisis came in, there has been some mishandling, right? So the intention of this regulation, if we as security professionals, we as vendors over here, take the financial regulation with a mindset that these are right thing for our customers. These are right thing for our, uh, you know, uh, the entire ecosystem of financial to build trust in the organization. If we go and approach these regulations and uh, these fi uh, fines, if you will, with that approach, then we have a very different mindset to protect. Right. So then we come up with the, you know, there are ISO 27K, there is, you know, shift left, shift up, all those kinds of things constitute that are we treating our the trust that customers are putting in fintech with respect. That is the bottom line. So everything falls in place, and I completely agree with Tom and Nir that we have to shift left. We have to bake it into the security, we uh, uh, bake it into the life cycle, and all that falls in place later. Okay, thanks for that, Yupendra. Definitely a, a eye-opening. And um, Tom, I want I want to get back to you with this question about uh, you know again about security, but you often design different fintech solutions for different clients of yours of yours, and um, you know. It will be interesting to understand from your point of view what kind of cyber fa factors you take into consideration when you do that. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can share this point with our audience, it will be interesting to understand. Yeah, definitely. So I, I mentioned it briefly um, in my, uh, when we talked about the earliest uh, question, but I think um, the factors you have to look at is uh, definitely the assets you will be dealing, uh, processing, saving, um, or whatever you do with them and that will affect how you need to uh, you know, secure them because there will be different regulations or different standards for each kind of asset. Again, credit cards you have to handle in a very specific way as the PCI uh, instructs you. If, it's, uh, if, you have, if, if somehow you have some sort of uh, health information because you're in fintech and you do insurance but still you get some sort of health information then if you work in the States then HIPAA might be applied. So again, the assets are very crucial in the market you're working in geographically and the type of companies you're working with, uh, they tend to have similar um, uh, requirements from the vendor as they themselves has um, the internal uh, uh, risk management. So they want to, they want to manage the risk the vendor present with them with. And, um, and so the company and the market, the companies in the market, um, that's basically the factors you should uh, should consider, and and it's important to look at the, all of the ecosystem of your product. So it's not just the the UI or the platform, the cloud environment that you deliver and you provide with, or it's also the development process. It's also the physical security if, if it's relevant. Sometimes you're just cloud hosted and it doesn't really matter, but. You need to look at the whole ecosystem because Appendrick can share, and I'm sure he's working with a lot of vendors. And each vendor is unique because the solution is unique, and therefore the risk is unique. So we really have to bring it to to show Appendra or his peers that you thought about it, and you're going to handle his assets in a very uh, secure manner, at least at the level that he is expecting it to be, or he is dealing and uh, securing his own assets. Pender, we can hear it from you. Uh, how do you see the, uh, let's say, three top fintech security concerns that companies should uh, should address? Yeah. <clears throat> so if we again, you know, continuing on the theme of fintechs, right? Um, if we look at the top three things, right? So let's look at the trends and why we are here, so that you know we can go ahead and you know look into a crystal ball. 
The first thing is the financial industry, if you recall, we have been using cash for exchanges of goods. As the internet came in, the consumer technology trends started you know, uh, growing. So that's why we started having mobile phones and Google wallets and Apple wallets. So started putting cards over there because consumer is there, right? Credit card form factor went away or it's still there, but it is a more in digitized form. So that is one trend where consumers are going more towards, um, you know, the, the different kinds of gadgets, if you will. I would, you know. The second trend that is happening is uh, the enterprises themselves are going cloud, right? So most of ours, it's no longer a four wall boundary. It's the boundaries are all over the map, right? So that is another trend for the fintech world. And then the third trend that is happening is because of all these newer attacks and financial crisis that we had in 2008, the third trend is the regulatory trend, right? So these are the three trends. So it's very interesting as to what happens. These trends are also in the hands of attackers. So they know where the gold mine is, which is in the fintech as well as healthcare and you know critical infrastructure and all that. But fintech is one of the um, you know industries. So they are after three things, right? So one is they are after the identity takeover, so that they can you know uh, basically take over the identity and replicate. The second thing they uh, you know they are after is um, a data loss, right? It's not just identity, it's, you know, your PII, uh, other kind of data that they, they can uh, take. And then third thing is committing fraud, right? So that is what they are after. So to answer your question, the, from the security perspective, if you look at it, there are these multiple channels, multi and, you know, where we don't have any boundaries. So multiple channels and attack can come in. There are multiple boundaries. So it's an omni-channel attack surface, uh, you know. Then um, uh, we also have uh, an enterprise that does not have these four wall boundaries. The top three attacks then come as malware. That's the way to basically go after this particular data and to commit fraud. The second thing is identity takeover, right? I mean, impersonating people. And then the third thing is data loss. I would have said DDoS, you know, last year, because last year, if you saw, uh, there was the 2.7 terabits per second worth of bit fat pipe that was pumped to bring the system down. This year, you know, we haven't seen that in the industry. And uh, I think it may be because people are after the top three things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So to summarize, lack of cash, uh, cloud-based services and um, uh, regulatory changes, the frequent regulatory changes are, are the, the, the trends. Guy, how do you see the main trends uh, from financial institutions uh, in, your, in your space? Yeah, and I guess everybody can speak from their own experiences. And we deal with, you know, a, a very, um, I don't know if it's a niche, but, you know, this uh, mo mobile capturing solution. So when I'd say the first trend we hear in, in this is first of all GDPR, right? So in, depending on the, the you know, where, where, where are we keeping the data that we're capturing, right? We're capturing mobile WhatsApp communications that traders are doing with their customers. Where are we keeping this data? Um, and you know, uh, that's a that's a that's a really important trend. And we kind of solve that by you know when we take the information, we always send it to the existing archive of the financial customer, so we don't care where it is. We can solve that uh, GDPR issue or any kind of specific regulatory issue that any geography has by sending the information, routing it to wherever he wants to. But it, it goes more than that because, you know, the basic questions would always be, you know, ISO. Do you have ISO 2717? Do you have ISO 2701? And, um, you know, do you have uh, data uh, uh, DRA sites or DR plans? There's a, you know, the standard questionnaires that we go through. Uh, but if you really speak about what they're asking about recently, it's a lot of, uh, you know, everybody wants to work with uh, their own end-to-end -end encryption. So it, it's, it, you know, our, our financial customers, they want to make sure that we don't have any uh, ability to view uh, any of their information. So we are uh, doing end-to-end -end encryption today uh, from some of the bigger customers. So they're bringing their own key. So BYOK. 
uh, is a huge trend. Um, you know, Zoom put it into their solutions and others are putting it into their solutions because uh, they don't want us or anybody else without that key with the ability to get and see the messages because these are very confidential. If, you know, Tom mentioned earlier, HIPAA compliant or in the financial world, it'll be, uh, you know, all these other regulations that we can talk about a little bit later, I guess, again. Um, but under all these regulations, uh, it needs to be archived, uh, but they don't want us to archive it. And that's where the GDPR together with Bring Your Own Key comes into play for encrypting it end to end and then shifting it off to the customer where he opens it up and he, he has it in his own premises and we don't have to deal with any kind of breaches. Super interesting trends and definitely seems that they are, um, you know, it's obvious why, why we see them in this period of time um, wh when we saw everything shifting to the web. When we saw during 2020, no one met face to face and everything was done on the web. So of course the cyber hacks were on the rise. And obviously these are the trends that are following this kind of very interesting era of humanity. So thanks guy, thanks for summarizing that. Let me add one more point, which I've seen recently a lot. And that's really, it was really strange for us as a you know, small company. We're only about 60 employees. But the, the banks that we're working with, you know, they have very strong DLP uh, procedures and, and products that you know, infor are enforced on you know, their emails in the organization. And they wanted us to have the same strict kind of DLP inside. And you know, our developers weren't even used to that. They used to be you know, being able to send out an email to anybody. But now you know, there's this pop-up that says, oh, you're sending out an email outside the organization. Are you? And, my guys weren't used to this and we had to put in these strong DLPs inside the company. And these are, we're hearing it more and more. I mean, two years ago, nobody asked us as a small company to have DLP, but now we have to have DLP. So the, it's just a one, another of these trends of customers asking for more and more, um, you know, requirements. Yeah, and yeah. you're absolutely right, guys. Sorry if I'm the near I'm uh, jumping in over here, but I'm just uh, adding, uh, you know, to what near is saying. Um, we are doing that as well, right? I mean, so because of the third party life cycle, TLM <clears throat> risks that we are seeing with supply chain and all that. It's just, you know, because we have our hearts at the right place, you know, we are requesting vendors and partners, uh, you know, to also comply with those similar kind of regulations that we have. So as you are an entrepreneur, as you are, you know, trying to sell to FinTech world, and I'm sure there are a few people here or they will be <clears throat> listening to the recording later on. <clears throat> Please consider this uh, in mind, whatever guy is mentioning is super critical, right? When you are building products, when you are selling to the FinTech, you know, customers, it is super imperative to comply by the similar regulations. I have a similar cadence. I have similar discipline in security and similar rigor. So that is pretty much expected. Of course, and we talked before about the heavy fines. There are no space for mistakes here. There's no room to make any um, wrong step. And uh, you know, hearing you guys, uh, Upendra and Guy, talking about different requirements and demands from the financial institutes, the, the 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 giants of the industry. Tom, maybe it will be interesting also to hear from your end about the requirements you tackle from the fintech companies you're developing products for. Uh, what do you see in, in your space? Oh, Tom, I think yeah. you're in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so, so I have to say that um, um, mostly um, we get startup companies um, coming to us um, when their clients asking them for uh, for their uh, uh, different requirements. Uh, usually, I mean, usually startup don't, doesn't come to us and say, "Well, listen, so we have some extra budget and we want to spend it on security." Um, and when they do come to us, first of all, I'm telling them that I think it's a good sign because they always come with like, ah, oh, this client asked me to do uh, an OSAC too. And I always give them the other side of it and, and I'm saying, this, this is good. This means you got to a size of the clients and a, a type of clients that are uh, significant and you're on the right track. So that's uh, something uh, good. And I think usually I can 
you mentioned, uh, I think it's penetration testing. Uh, usually they want us to do some sort of penetration testing for the platform. Um, and the rest are around compliance. So it will be the ISO 27001, which is very, very known and globally accepted, the SAC 2 and uh, PCI. That's usually what they come for, come for with. And the ISO SOC 2 and PCI holds a lot of different mini projects inside of them. So they talk about awareness and they talk about product security. They talk about infrastructure security. They talk about processes within the uh, organization. So they hold a lot of what the, uh, their clients want to see. Um, and it also helps them with the questionnaires that I'm sure every startup knows and uh, go through the questionnaires are just um, exhaustive, long, takes a lot of time and they, um, they really put you in a struggle to, um, 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 to grow to scale because you can't grow and scale fast without answering these questionnaires, it's a must. Um, while having ISO, SOC 2, PCI, and the different uh, things already done, it's relatively more easy and quick to answer these questionnaires. Um, so that's what we see with startup company mostly. Why can't we have just one questionnaire for everybody? I mean, it, this is so <laughs> annoying. I mean, this go, it drives us crazy. The amount of hours we're spending our security guys on answering these questionnaires that Tom just mentioned. I mean, there's the... Everybody has his own format. And then there's the, some of these standards like the CAIQ standard uh, that we answer this questionnaire. There's the ATAC standard, I believe. And, and, and it just goes on and on. It's just, yeah. Guy, I know. It's that. I can actually give a few uh, practical tips around questionnaires. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Tom. That's why we're here. Yeah. So, so I think every startup company needs to, um, at, at the right time to make a decision about the revenue that beneath that revenue you say okay i won't be handling this questionnaire i'll send them a white label or some um, pdf that i have that explain everything we do and it really needs to be an exhaust um, a good pdf that explain everything so the other side can read and understand what you do and from above a certain revenue you start to decide on okay i'm going to answer this questionnaires I'm going to answer this questionnaire once and maybe if they have uh, any other questions uh, we can put it in under some sort of a contract so and it it, it is a framework that you need to uh, you need to build within your organization to enable yourself to grow but at the same time respect the other side and allow him to get the answers that he's looking for because again as Apendra said we are all here for the same reason which is providing secure financial services to our clients our clients come to us uh, to use these financial services and knowing that we will secure their data and use it wisely. And we cannot um, betray this uh, understanding because this will be devastating for the whole ecosystem. Once the client loses the faith in the security of the fintech industry, we will all uh, be without a, without a job at the end. <laughs> Of course, we are in favor of the, of the fintech industry and about uh, in favor of the security of the fintech <laughs> industry. In this environment. It goes without saying, and I understand, Tom, that uh, in GLC you can help different companies to structure their white papers and these kind of PDFs to answer all kinds of uh, questionnaires, uh, like a questionnaire template. Uh, and uh, that's encouraging to hear that. Um, Guy, you, you started talking about different uh, regulations and uh, and aspects of compliance, and you deal a lot with uh, mobile communication. So, you know, are there any specific uh, rules and regulations that are uh, basically basically mentioning the mobile communication aspects? Yeah, th th thanks for that question, Nir. So, um, every geography uh, has a different set of regulations, and they're all a little bit different. So, I mean, the biggest market that we sell into, which is the United States, the financial uh, regulatory authority, the main, the biggest one is FINRA. And mm -hmm. FINRA set out a set of, of, of uh, regulations that state very clearly that text messaging and instant messaging needs to be retained. They don't talk about security there. They talk about retention. So they don't care if the message that the broker is sending his customer is encrypted as long as it's retained. And there's been massive fines. Uh, FINRA is a very strong regulatory authority and it 
feels uh, very confident on, on putting those fines on, on some of its uh, regulations. If we go over the sea in Europe, uh, there's the MIFID II framework, which was built on MIFID I, which is a crazy huge framework, which we, we're not experts on. But there are a number of very set paragraphs on capturing of mobile communications. And they expand on the federal regulations. So it's not only text messaging, it's also voice recalls recording. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it needs to capture uh, any kind of recording that you make to your customer. Now, it's not only the direct recordings, it's anything that can lead to a financial transaction. So even if it's a customer that just doing some kind of marketing message to his customer, but he's not doing a sale itself, he's not you know, sealing the transaction, you know, buying or selling of the shares, for example, he's just sending in some information that of course needs to be recorded. And we go over all of this in APAC. Um, I mean, Singapore has the MSA, uh, it's the Monetary uh, Singaporean Authority, and there's the um, Hong Kong Authority, I can't forget his name, and there's ASIC in Australia. So every country has its own set of regulations. Uh, the main uh, common theme around all of them is retention of uh, communications. And it is, yes, it is mainly inside the more... Um, modern financial uh, countries where they have uh, strong uh, financial regulations. So you'd see less of these regulations in, you know, far um, in, 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 you know, less advanced in, countries. In developing countries. Yeah. And it will be also interesting, interesting to understand. I mean, you're saying it has to be recorded if it's a voice communication over mobile phone, but it doesn't necessarily has to be uh, encrypted. True. Yes. So that, it's, that's right. it's very par paradoxical, like the, to, to say. It. And what about what about text messages, WhatsApp, WeChat? Can we use them with our clients as financial institutions? Well, you can use them if you can capture them. Um, yeah. So a lot of our, our uh, the story that we tell our customers, and they they had they used to have a no texting policy. You're not allowed to send out text messages. They all understand that that doesn't work, and Finra does not approve that. So a no texting policy doesn't solve the problem because FINRA knows that these brokers are going to be communicating over text with their customers. Um, and then moves to, okay, you're not allowed to text, but no WhatsApp policy. But that's ridiculous as well, as Israelis are on, the, on this or anybody else, they know that there's, I mean, it, there's no communication without WhatsApp. You're not gonna speak to an Israeli without WhatsApp. And if you go to China, I mean, if you don't WeChat, then you're not communicating. Um, so exactly. it's not a matter of, texting or mobile, you know, calling it, you need to capture WeChat. So hiding it under the rug is not going to work. Uh, you need to capture the communications. And uh, even though uh, um, there is no very specific Chinese regulations, China is a huge financial market in any of the Western countries. I mean, uh, companies in uh, the banks in the United States and they're communicating with somebody in China that needs to be captured because they're regular regulated. So the global world is making all of these regulations very complicated because if you're a UK person and you communicate with somebody in a developing country, you need to capture those recordings. Uh, but in the United States, if you start recording, that might be a problem because uh, you're not allowed in some, you're not allowed in some states to have, you have two party consent. So it, it's, it, it, it is complicated. We it don't is complicated. But definitely encouraging to hear that you can help companies <laughs> to solve this issue. So uh, contact the guy if you're trying to figure out how to <laughs> navigate in between different regulations in the U.S. market and different uh, in other markets, of course. And Yupendra, you know, let, let's get back to you because um, we, we started talking about different requirements of fintech companies when we started talking about mobile communication. And, you know, in the last year, we all started working from home and, you know, suddenly we all started to use our WhatsApp, WeChat, or text messaging for basically for work purposes. So how do you see the work from home environment affecting different fintech companies uh, in terms of cybersecurity aspects, of course? How do you see that? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, before we go into work from home, one of the things I wanted to just comment on what Guy is saying, right? I mean, when... We are, uh, you know, we are into this uh, BNPL space and, you know, there are obviously customers going to call us and even, in, you know, my previous employers, right? I mean, customers call us and uh, they might have to fulfill the payment. So the credit card debt or whatever, right? I mean, it doesn't really matter what. There are 
requirements where they might have to uh, you know fulfill the payment either by whatsapp or either by you know telegram signal wechat uh, you know text messages for all we know right I mean, they might not have uh, whatsapp so how do we securely fulfill uh, you know those and you know accept the payment information on text messages these are some of the real practical requirements where the consumer technology, as I was talking about the three trends, right? Consumer technology trends, enterprise technology trends, um, and then regulatory trends, right? I mean, sometimes regulation and consumer technology trends, uh, you know, they butt head, right? So this is a very classic example. So Guy, thanks for pointing that particular thing out. Um, you know, because of COVID, and I hope all you guys who are here, as well as people who are listening um, at, uh, right now or today, I hope all of you are safe, your loved ones are safe. These are very, very tough times. Um, when pandemic hit us, it was an immediate shelter in place. We all had to work from home for safety of our employees. Nothing, nothing can go beyond the safety of employees. We have to find a way to secure our employees, uh, safe, uh, you know, make sure that their health is first, and then secure our systems. You know, so that those kind of were a little bit contradictory goals, but we had to do it. So you know, we all were scrambling. I mean, to be honest with you, it was not that we prepared. We had to work from home, right? I mean, people used to sometimes work from Friday, use VPN, the traditional ways of hopping onto the network, you know, so that was all, you know, uh, fine. The problem was that particular risk was very limited, and now you're just expanding it beyond. Another thing is that lots of, while we were on this journey, lots of SaaS where been uh, you know we, we started opening up to lots of like you know we have uh, human resources SaaS, so we have customer CRM SaaS we have multiple SaaS so at that particular point when we started allowing the remote work and that became more like a shelter in place we started focusing on securing the home network. So, uh, you know, the way, well, you know, we started doing was, okay, guys, how do we train people? Another problem that we started facing was um, customer support, right? In general, how do we take care of the customer support when the payment information or anything has been, you know, uh, addressed and now the person is at home, right? I mean, if you call any financial institution, the customer support is, now sitting in the uh, at home and might be scribbling credit card away or whatever payment card away right so how do we secure that particular population so that was another trend so the way we started thinking about this problem is okay guys safety first of our employees second thing is uh, segregate those people who are going to be high risk, uh, you know, in terms of they carry the real PII and start locking it down from the zero trust perspective. Mm -hmm. And then we, we started a typical, you know, prediction and all those kinds of things, um, prediction, protection, prevention, detection, um, you know, recovery and response, all these multiple, uh, you know, tactics we started doing. And then we started, um, actually understanding the behavior of those that particular class of employees so to answer your question safety first zero trust and find out the high risk you know population or the employees of your team and try to focus on them so those were the three things. Yeah, started uh, and uh, thanks for that, Yupendra. I mean, you're talking about many aspects of the cybersecurity program. You're talking about prevention, detection, response, employee education, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, it will be interesting also to understand from your point of view, Tom, um, if 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 you think that this kind of cybersecurity program can be outsourced. I mean, do you mm -hmm. think? And, and we know it's complicated, right? Uh, to what extent do you think that the fintech company can outsource this kind? of a complex project uh, to, to an external uh, uh, service provider? Yeah, so, so it's, it's a good question. I do wanna piggyback right on what Appendra said. I think that actually um, the fact that uh, remote work is much more um, 
um, accepted now uh, after COVID. And that's basically expanding the cyber attack surface significantly. And I think that businesses not always aware of the surface attack that they're presenting to different malicious actors. So I think a good risk assessment, a good mapping of what you're exposing, it's really important because as a panel said, when it hit us, there was no time. Safety was first, everybody walked from home. Let's just keep it running, see how we see how we uh, fix it along the way. So take a look back, see what you did, what you opened, see how you secure it. I think it's a very crucial uh, time and I think it's going to be it's going to be with us for a while. Um, so that's something I really wanted to uh, uh, put in there. And in regards to outsourcing the program, I think it really, again, case by case, it really depends on the resources, uh, mostly budget, but resources that you can put in uh, on the program. Um, if you have the capacity and the uh, team uh, that knows and, and, and or you can get the team in, in-house that know how to build the program, how to conduct the program, how to perform the different tasks, it can definitely be in-house. If you don't have the capacity for it or the budget uh, resources for it. It can also be outsourced. Um, it can be a mix of both um, having someone to come in and help build the program. Then some of the tasks will be handled uh, internally. Some of the tasks will be uh, handled uh, by, uh, by vendors. Um, but again, the most important thing is make sure that the program um, support the business. And if it's outsourced or in-house, it, it can be both. Again, really depends on the really depends on the budgetary and the, the maturity of the company. Yeah, yeah. And when, when we usually uh, deal with like um, sidekicks and stuff that are not uh, that are not uh, part of the core business uh, of the specific business, such as I don't know if you talk about car leasing or if you talk about employees meals or stuff like this. So we like to outsource this stuff. So uh, you know. I guess that my modest recommendation to the to our viewers and listeners will be if you don't know how exactly to execute this kind of super complicated program, so uh, probably uh, Tom can help with this and his team. Um, and, and Guy, maybe we'll ask you, I mean, you, you obtained this kind of certification with your company and uh, you now hold it and maybe you'll share with our audience what were the main challenges of securing this kind of complicated certificate. Uh, maybe we can learn something out of it. Maybe. Um, so the first thing as a small company is, is yes, take a consultant. Um, I strongly advise take a consultant. Um, and uh, it definitely helped us a lot. And we're still using uh, external consult consultants, um, not only for obtaining the ISO certifications, which we definitely needed help on that, but also, you know, we need external penetration testers. We can't do it internally and we want it externally. But that being said, uh, I mean, the biggest challenge is, first of all, to get the internal uh, buy-in. So we needed to have somebody dedicated that can drive the process. But luckily for Telemessage, our IT manager for the last 20 years is, a, you know, he's very security-minded and he loves security and he always uh, wanted, and he, he, you know, he, on his own, uh, even five years ago, was, was when it was less important to Telemessage, we sold less to financial companies. He did his own uh, CISO certification. So we needed somebody dedicated for that. He's perfect. But then you also need management uh, attention. Uh, I mean, he needed to get me on board in the beginning. I said, ah, I don't care about this. Ah, I don't that. But I mean, he, he brought me on board and I needed to bring the, the rest of the management on board. And uh, I mean, even challenges, as I mentioned earlier, DLP. I mean, I, I had programmers here saying, complaining, I don't want this DLP and I don't want this Intunes on my phone. I don't want an MDN. This is a BYD. I bought this device and I don't and I don't you know I don't want it but at the end of the day it's it's a process and there's people and you need to have all the people involved and it's management and it's the dedicated guy and it's the external consultant so it's a lot of challenges but it's it's all something that can be handled even in very small companies um we're not that small right we're almost 60 people but it's 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 small size still mm -hmm. okay and uh, you Brenda from your point of view, it will be interesting to hear as well. Um, I mean, you are in the buy now, pay now business, right? Um, and this is a huge trend right now. I mean, I think that the COVID situation 
actually benefited you and companies such as uh, um, uh, such as Snap Finance. And I, I think that many households were de were dealing with a situation of uh, low cash flows, and the buy now pay later situation uh, allows them to keep on purchasing. And um, it will be interesting to hear. How do you see the main trends from your consumers, from your end consumers, and from the regulator on this specific aspect of the buy now, pay later, BNPL? Yeah, you know, I'm, 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 I'm super glad, and it's very, really, very rewarding and fulfilling to all of us to help our customers, especially when they are in dire need, right? So this BNPL space. Uh, you know, sure, we are here for our customers and it, it is very rewarding to be part and helping somebody who is actually needing that particular uh, goods or services, if you will, and they can pay later, you know, when they're going through tough times. So this is very rewarding and very fulfilling. And, uh, you know, our commitment did not change up to the regulation. Our commitment did not change to the customers where we wanted to make sure that we protect their information, like Tom was saying, right? I mean, that is a commitment. And then we will use the information only in certain places. So as the regulatory pressure come in, as these kind of trends, so when, when we are looking at the trends, what we have to go to the spirit of what regulators are after. And I completely agree that, uh, you know, there are multiple regulations and all this question <laughs> to what Guy was talking about, you know, there are so many nuances. It will be good to automate it so that, you know, it, it gets a little bit easier on people like us. Uh, there are a few companies in space, but I would say for the entrepreneurs who are on the call or who will listen to this particular podcast, please think about how do we ease the job of the CISO as, uh, in the fintech world as well as outside and all these regulatory trends. So from the trend perspective, we will start seeing more and more, con again, I'm, I'm getting back to the three themes, right? So the consumer trends will continue to evolve. So we'll have to go where the customer is. It might be the text-based payment, the mobile is obviously there, uh, right? I mean, the WhatsApp, the WeChats of the world. So that's where the payment and the trend is going to go. Omnichannel trend is there in the sense that they will be making a phone call at the same time they want to secure a payment. And at the same time, when the employee or the contact uh, customer care support agent is at home, we don't want that particular credit card to be misused or mishandled. So that's one trend. So go where the consumer trend is while we are doing work, uh, work from home, while we are enabling remote work. The second trend is, as we are looking at our enterprise, you know, shackling all these four wall boundaries, right? So it's no longer four wall boundary. We have SaaS, we have public cloud, hybrid cloud, we have some in our data centers. The, we have some BPOs, you know, so that's our organization structure. It's no longer that hey, you have to just have these firewalls and three-tiered architectures, all those lines are broken right now, right? So that is going to increase the challenge for us to demonstrate that we comply by all regulations. So the regulation process can slow down. So there is a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs who are listening to think about that, guys, how do we ease the job of the security professionals like me, where the compliance becomes very easy or demonstration of that particular compliance becomes very easy. So under regulatory trends, they are gonna increase, you know, especially with all the supply chain attacks that we are seeing, uh, you know, the, the third party. So, you know, like Tom was talking about the tax surface management, these are gonna come and these are gonna, you know, sure it will be a lagging indicator or, uh, you know, laggards, but they will come. So how can we prepare ourselves for these three trends? Yeah, you know, and when you're talking about um, the fact that you are instructing entrepreneurs to start thinking on these aspects. And, you know, when you're talking to young fintech companies, um, it, it's definitely one aspect you should consider 
uh, probably sooner is better. I don't know, Tom, what's your opinion about it? I mean, if you'll go to a fintech company or you know, early stage entrepreneur, early stage fintech, um, what would be your recommendation for these guys? When should they start talking about compliance aspects and working on compliance aspects? Um, my honest answer, I think it's the, the earlier the better. Uh, it's easier as you're a small company uh, to build the processes and then to follow when you grow. Um, but real life, what we see is usually when the customer, uh, their, their client's requirements come, then they go and start to deal with compliance. Um, again, it comes down to the budget, it comes down to the risk appetite of the business. Um, I, I really suggest for uh, early companies to do some sort of a minimum or some sort of uh, something that they can uh, work with, which is a risk assessment to understand what you're facing with, where are your risks, what are the assets that you're dealing with, and a penetration test to secure the platform. Um, and from there to take it step by step and understand what your client is going to ask you for and just and start winning those uh, winning those small wins every every once in a while. Um, but again, if you can start early, start early. It will be much more easier. It will relieve much more stress up ahead in the way because when the client asks you for SOC 2 and you already have the deal pending, you want to do the SOC 2 in uh, two weeks, but you can't do SOC 2 in two weeks. It takes time. There's a lot of uh, action items to do. There's an auditor that needs to come and check everything. So if you can start earlier, it will be a smooth, uh, a better and a smooth sailing along the way. Um, but again, there, there are limit, limitations and uh, we, have to do, to, we have to live the life as, uh, as, as they are presented to us. Thanks for that, Tom. You're talking about uh, audit and, uh, you know, it will be maybe interesting to hear from you guys in terms of the certificate you're holding, um, to, to what extent you are um, exposed to audits in, in, on this aspect? How do, you, how do you see that and how do you handle that? Yeah, first of all, I wanted to say that I agree with Tom, of course. I mean, the sooner, I, I, I wish we would have sooner started sooner. Yeah, I, yeah. I wish we would have yeah. started sooner. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, to tell you the truth, th there are not a lot of audits that they would that you know that we go after. It, it's it's in the sales process. I mean, I have customers for years that they didn't audit us, uh, but we were never leaked as well. So I guess that we didn't have to go through any breaches. Um, but they're very sensitive on all the you know on the pre-sales process. It, it's very. I mean, we talked about the certifications. They talked. We talked about uh, the uh, questionnaires. Uh, I mean, these guys are seriously afraid of having their information breached um, and they are regulated and they have to go through the process. So they're, they're making sure that we're going through that processes and they have to check all the boxes and, you know, dot all the uh, I's and cross those T's. Uh, we do have a theoretically access to very sensitive information. Um, the, the customers are going through and they can't have it leaked or, or breached. So, you know, GDPR, that's crazy, right? GDPR, what, what's the number? It's 4% of overall annual revenue that could be fined. These, yeah. They don't want to pay 4% a fine. Crazy. It, it, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't make any sense, but that's the fine, right? And they, they want to make sure that uh, they don't have to go that through that fine and they're dependent on their vendors uh, like us that make sure that uh, they don't have to pay those fines. So, you know, before we wrap it up and uh, I'll see we uh, running out of time, even though this is a super interesting discussion, we can keep on going uh, this all, all, night long, all night long. I have the feeling that uh, uh, you guys are the right team to uh, further investigate this topic. Uh, but uh, before we wrap it up and thank you all, um, maybe in, quick, in a quick sentence, how do you see the future of this segment? How do you see the future of compliance and security? Uh, and again, let's focus on the fintech segment and cyber to fintech companies. How do you see and where, where do you see it going? Tom, let's start with you. Um, so I, I think really the fact that uh, the attack surface is expanding significantly, uh, using cloud uh, providers, uh, working from home, having different uh, um, um, cloud hosting uh, services. Um, I think that's uh, that's a trend, and I think securing that that's one of the biggest uh, challenges. 
um, knowing what the different team are using is a challenge. So securing that is uh, is a bigger challenge. So that's my uh, take on the that. cloud security. I'll take that. Uh, cloud security and expanded scope, expanded scope of uh, of uh, of companies. Good. Right. Okay. Thanks for that, Yupendra. What's your insights on that? My insight is the future is bright. I'm always, uh, always optimistic. That's my trend. You know, we will find a way and then it's just a matter of protecting our customers in the right way and we will get through this, right? We are very resilient species, you know, so we will continue to do that. We are, and I'll adopt your method here. If it works for you, it can work for all of us. Thanks for that. And the uh, guy, any less I, 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 Yeah, the future is bright as well. I appreciate I love that. Um, and, uh, you know, we just read the news in Israel. I don't know if you guys read that. Of course you did. Uh, you know, Google is going to be opening up their, the cloud uh, in Israel as well, which is a great step forward for the local Israeli uh, companies. But, you know, the cloud is, is the trends, right? Uh, and even financial institutions, which were not used to working in the cloud at all, they're going to be moving to the cloud. Um, and working from home, we already talked about that's a huge trend which brings us in the mobile field to say that BYOD is a big trend, bring your own device. So employees which used to be regulated with their corporate phones, they're gonna be moving more and more to a BYOD environment. So it makes it our world more complicated, mobile capture since you have to have WhatsApp and a BYOD device and it makes the whole world uh, uh, more complicated. So I, I, as much as I want the future to be brighter, it's gonna be more complicated. <laughs> so you have an argument offline, you two. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll take your, uh, your insights here as well, Guy. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great honor to host you all. Guy Levit from Telemessage, Uprendra Mordikar from Snap Finance, Tom Rosen for GRC, and Sharon, thank you very much for hosting us with CICC here today. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, many other dis insightful discussions such as this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, so much. thank you, everybody. Thanks for having Thank you, Nir, for Thanks, hosting and, and organizing this session. Um, I think that the, the one takeaway is uh, just trying to summarize what all of you said is that we'll see more devices, more ways of communications, um, and therefore we need more security. And the sooner companies, um, you know, pay attention to that aspect and not just developing their solution or their system. Um, it will be easier for the solution at the end of the day to be complying with all the regulations, no matter where it is around the world. The world is flat. Um, so with that, thank you all for being with us today. Thank you for, uh, um, you know, thank you to Fintech Aviv uh, for co-sponsoring this uh, activity. If you are an Israeli startup, this is the place for you to be in order to get more information about the ecosystem. If you need some uh, support in terms of developing your um, uh, solutions in cyber and, and provide the cybersecurity aspect, please talk to Guy and uh, GRC uh, if you need to work on your compliance uh, certificate. Thank you, Pendra, for uh, bringing your insights. Appreciate all of you. Um, again, this uh, session was recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel and other social media uh, aspects. Thank you. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye.